43 minutes into what should have been a normal two-hour flight. Air Asia Flight 8501 disappears from radar. In Douala, Cameroon, Kenya Airways Flight 507 is almost an hour behind schedule. Ladies and gentlemen, we are going to wait for the weather conditions to improve before we take off. A severe storm must pass before the pilots can depart. Tower, Kenya 507. Looks like there's a break in the weather. Requesting startup. Okay, 507, startup approved. Startup checklist, quickly, please. Uh, generators on. A few minutes before midnight, Flight 507 is finally ready for takeoff. Okay. Takeoff thrust is set. Speed building on board. Check. 80 knots. Check. V1. Rotate. Just after midnight, Kenya Airways Flight 507 finally departs for Nairobi. Suddenly, the 737 rolls dangerously to the right. The captain fights to level the plane. But it continues banking further and further right. Despite the pilot's efforts, they keep rolling. Crashing! Angle. Yeah, we are crashing. Left, Bank left, angle. left correction. Five hours later, the controller in Douala is ending his shift. Dula Tower. No reason I can think of. They should be there by now. Kenya Airways Flight 507 should have landed in Nairobi 45 minutes ago, but the plane has still not arrived. Sure. And no one even knows where to start looking for it. Two days later, search teams finally locate the wreckage of Kenya 507. It's three and a half miles southeast of Douala Airport. The 737 has crashed into a mangrove swamp and is submerged in mud and water. There are no survivors. It's been almost 48 hours since Thai Airways Flight 311 disappeared in the Himalayas. Investigators have yet to find the aircraft. But now they're about to get an important break. Local villagers report that they found aircraft debris north of Kathmandu. The reported crash site is nowhere near the area they've been searching. I don't think they ever, in their wildest imagination, thought the airplane was north of the airport. North of Kathmandu, near the border with Tibet, the Himalayan peaks soar to an altitude of 20,000 feet. These northern summits are the reason almost all planes approach Tribhuvan Airport from the south, where the mountains are closer to 8,000 feet. Later that day, 27 miles north of Kathmandu, search crews find the remains of Thai Airways Flight 311. The point of impact is a steep rock face more than 11,000 feet up the side of a remote mountain. None of the 113 people on board have survived. The challenge for investigators is unlike anything they've encountered before. The terrain is so extreme, helicopters can't land near the impact zone. The team will have to trek more than 3,000 feet up from the base camp to reach the wreckage. 
It's a treacherous five-hour hike. The team includes experts from around the world, including Canada's David Rohrer. The level of destruction was uh, enormous. You couldn't tell that you had an Airbus A310 aircraft there. I mean, you couldn't even tell you had two engines. The first big question they have is how did Thai Airways Flight 311 end up here? The Airbus should never have been flying north of the airport. Right over there. An airport hangar in Kathmandu is the final stop on a long journey for wreckage collected from the mountainside. The Sherpas would bring down the pieces that we identified down to the landing zone. Then the uh, Nepalese army and their helicopters would put them in nets and, and then sling them down to the hangar at the airport. As team members comb through the wreckage, the investigation takes an unexpected turn. Excuse me. Can I help you? During the investigation, one of the family members was asking for a circuit board uh, just because they somehow would link them to their loved one. The unusual request leads to an incredible find. That's when we actually found the uh, internal mechanism of the, of the recorder we were missing, which was quite amazing. The FDR should provide crucial data on the plane's speed, direction, and altitude throughout the flight. You always hope that luck is on your side, that things will happen to your benefit, and those are the kind of moments you really hope for as an investigator. It's the breakthrough they've been waiting for, evidence that could reveal how a plane flying south of the airport ended up slamming into mountains to its north. At Los Angeles International Airport, United Airlines Flight 718 is preparing to depart for Chicago. At 9.04 in the morning, Flight 718 lifts off from Los Angeles. Captain Shirley must follow an assigned corridor through the airspace around Los Angeles. After that, he's free to fly wherever he wants, as long as he reports in, passing a series of waypoints along the route to Chicago. 54 minutes into the flight, the DC-7 reaches its second waypoint. The crew will next check in when they cross a point on the map known as the Painted Desert Line. Cruising at 21,000 feet, the crew spots thunderclouds ahead and adjusts their course. How are we doing on your side, Bob? Thunderhead five miles south. We're clear of it. Damn! Shocked passengers have no idea what's gone wrong. Oh, God! Bang, 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 bang! Come on, baby, come on! Flight 718 is overdue to check in. Calls from dispatch go unanswered. Air Traffic Control Headquarters in Salt Lake City. CA Salt Lake. Controllers here don't normally communicate directly with flight crews. They get flight information by phone from airline dispatchers who are in radio contact with their pilots. At 10.51, they get a disturbing call from United Airlines dispatch. Salt Lake, understand, United 718, 20 minutes overdue at Painted Desert. Moments later, another dispatcher calls. More disturbing news. Salt Lake, TWA, I'm getting no response from flight two. Understand, TWA, flight two, 20 minutes overdue at Painted Desert. We have had no contact here. Controllers now know that two planes flying from LA have not reported crossing a scheduled waypoint, the Painted Desert Line. United Flight 718 and TWA Flight 2 to Kansas City were both expected to reach that waypoint at 10.31. Controllers send out a bulletin asking local authorities to keep an eye out for the two missing planes. The next morning, news comes from authorities in Arizona confirming everyone's worst fears. They found him. The remains of two different planes have been spotted in Arizona's Grand Canyon. 
The twisted wreckage of United 718 lies in a rocky ledge 688 feet up the sheer canyon wall. The air tour pilot spots the second crash site on the floor of the canyon about one mile away. The immediate priority is to get rescuers into one of the least accessible places in North America. When rescuers finally reach the crash area, they first find the scattered remains of TWA Flight 2. Reaching the wreckage of the other plane will be even more difficult. It's not long before rescuers come to a grim conclusion. Everyone aboard both planes is dead. It is now up to investigators from the Civil Aeronautics Board to piece together what happened. May 31st, 2009. Air France Flight 447 is crossing the Atlantic. The Airbus A330 is flying overnight from Rio de Janeiro to Paris. 58-year-old Captain Marc Dubois is in command. Here's the new forecast. He's been a pilot for well over half his life and is now one of the most senior captains at Air France. Uh, it's hard to see anything in this plane with this lighting. First officer Pierre Cedric Bonin is 32 years old. He's been flying the A330 for about a year. We are arriving at Intol. 37-year-old relief pilot David Robert is on standby. The three pilots fly in shifts to stay alert. There are 216 passengers on the 11-hour flight. Autopilot holds the plane steady at 35,000 feet. And the crew communicates with Brazilian air traffic control. Air France 447 contact Atlantic Center. As they fly, an onboard computer monitors the engines, hydraulics, and other systems. It also sends progress reports to Air France headquarters. Every 10 minutes, the computer transmits the plane's position along with any maintenance data. Air France 447 calling Atlantico. Air France 447 Atlantico, go ahead. Three hours into the flight, the captain reports reaching a navigational waypoint off the coast of Brazil. Air France 447 position in tow. Maintain flight level 350. Okay, will do. At 1.49 a.m., the A330 leaves Brazilian radar surveillance and enters a communications dead zone over the mid-Atlantic. Two hours later, an air traffic controller in Senegal tries to contact the flight. Air France 447, this is Dakar. Do you copy? Come in, Air France 447. He can't reach the crew, so he alerts Air France. Dakar for Air France, have you heard from Air 447 over there? Negative. Hold for Air France, please. No one has heard from the crew of Flight 447. The only communication, 24 maintenance messages transmitted by the plane hours earlier. An Air France maintenance worker tries to make contact, but his message bounces back. Perhaps the communication system has failed. By the time the plane should have reached French airspace, controllers still can't make contact. At Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, the 11.10 a.m. arrival time comes and goes with no sign of Flight 447. The A330 would have run out of fuel by now. The airline begins notifying families. The plane is almost certainly crashed at sea. By the afternoon of June 1st, the world learns that Flight 447 from Rio to Paris has mysteriously vanished. It's one of the worst accidents in the history of commercial aviation. An advanced passenger jet is gone. 228 people are presumed dead. Air Asia Flight 8501 cruises high above the Java Sea north of Indonesia. The pilot in command is 53-year-old Captain Irianto. 
He's highly experienced with more than 20,000 hours in the air. His first officer is French national Rémy Emmanuel Plaisel. He is 46 with about 2,000 flight hours, much of it on the Airbus. 22 minutes into the flight, the pilots notice bad weather ahead on their radar. The captain decides to increase altitude to go above the storm clouds in their path. I'm going to radio for a higher cruise, get around that weather. Good idea. But before the captain can contact air traffic control, he gets a fault warning from the flight computer. Ecam actions. The plane's sophisticated computers give the pilot step-by-step -step instructions on how to fix the issue. The pilots now notice that the plane is rolling sharply left. Level. OK, level. Something is going terribly wrong with flight 8501. The first officer is struggling. Level. But soon, the plane is rolling again. Level. I'm trying. The pilots can't seem to regain control. <laughs> it's not responding. Pull down. <laughs> it's not correcting. The plane seems to have taken on a life of its own. It climbs higher and higher as the pilots fight to level off. Then, inexplicably, the plane starts to drop. Altitude. I see it. Flight 8501 is plummeting from the sky, speeding toward the ocean below. It seems the pilots can do nothing to save their plane. Paul, it's not correcting. What's going on? Max power. Slowly. Forty-three minutes into what should have been a normal two-hour flight, Air Asia Flight 8501 disappears from radar. Pull! I'm trying. Pull! It's not correcting. Of the 162 passengers and crew, there are no survivors.